Our first guest's prose and poetry have appeared in a wide variety of print and online journals. He lives right here in Andersonville and works at an independent, uh, independent bookstore. He also blogs about poetry and other things that lives with Lives of the Spiders. With Kathy Burtquist, he is the author of A Field Guide to Gay and Lesbian Chicago. Please welcome Robert McDonald. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I read a lot about spiders, but I decided I needed a new obsession. So I started <laughs> obsessing about um, swans. In particular, there's, there's this Grimm's fairy tale. It's often called the wild swans. And it, it, there's, there's everything to love about it. It has not one, but two wicked stepmothers, <laughs> two, two witches, um, and of course, a bunch of princes who get turned into swans and their sister who tries to save them. Um, so I retold, I, I did a series of poems that retold this story. I can't do them all tonight, so I'm just going to start with the wedding. Um, I'm getting married uh, in September, and I think my, the wedding will go a lot like this. <laughs> wedding with swans. She was their mother-to-be, the witch, and she gave each sibling a wedding gift. Vests for the boys, blue velvet vests with buttons of ivory. Wear a white shirt, she said, and what a platoon of groomsmen at the wedding you will be, squires to make your father proud. And all seven brothers agreed. For the youngest, the princess, the witch sewed a skirt made of red bird wings, and she hummed a tuneless song as the needle did its work. Her attendants told each other she was embroidering a curse. Scarlet suits you, she told the girl. With your ink dark hair and your pale skin, you are your father's heart, my dear. On the wedding day, the procession winds its way to the church, up an avenue lined with priests, page boys, and ladies in waiting. Among them, the brothers, seven lords arrayed in vests as blue as northern lakes in the sun, buttons shining like little full moons. But the girl, their sister, wears a simple white shift, gathered with a jeweled belt that had been her mother's. No one could make her wear the skirt the witch gave her, the blood red skirt made of red bird wings. Fine, thought the witch. Some problems may be solved with the simplest solution, a dagger, say, or a poisoned cup. <laughs> another day, the witch thought, another day, a better time. The witch wears a gown as green as springtime, emeralds at her throat and clasped to her wrists, a green egg fastened to her suspiciously long finger. She is tall and terrible, the new queen, the witch. She twists her ring like a doorknob and whispers a phrase no one could understand, even if they heard it. At her word, the vest she gave the brothers quiver and pulse. The princes arc their backs as wings, once hidden, rip up and out of their strained shoulders. Look, they lean back and expose the tendons in their throats. Their necks lengthen, handles on a porcelain vase. A minute less, seven young men wrenched and turned to the form of swans, who then in a panic fly upward and away. Grit and feathers, spatters of bird shit on the arms and faces of the wedding attendants, the honored guests. The witch, that sly tree, is curiously untouched. Well, she says to the king, I can't believe your sons would disrespect you like that. It's a shame when children don't want their parents to be happy. <laughs> she leads the king, the priests, the sullied attendants, the muttering guests, her astonished, unbelieving stepdaughter to be. The witch leads them, a, pr a pestiferous lantern to the church and the bishop, the blessings and the vows. One son, my darling, one more, mine, she told her new husband, the white-haired king. That's all I need this sad root to spit out. Tenderly, she removes the old man's pantaloons. I will raise him on ogre's milk and stallion's blood pudding. His sword shall be forged in a lake of molten rock, and his kingdom, your kingdom, will double each year as he leads his armies through a thousand battles won. In the king's bedchamber, she is glorious and nude. She leads the old man, he is not unwilling, leads him step by tottering step. Look how blue his turned in feet, leads him to his little death, his kingdom come, the afterglow, a witch's kiss, his final stiffened sleep. <laughs> So I was thinking a lot about these princes who were, they're, they're swans every year, um, 
Once a year, they get to return to the castle and talk to their sister for a few minutes, and then they fly away again. And the sister has done a vow of silence, to, so she can't speak for seven years, and she's also knitting some kind of shirt for them. And she throws the shirt over them, and it's going to turn them back into a person. But as the story goes, one, the, little, the youngest son, um, she didn't finish his shirt, so one sleeve was missing, so he has one arm that's forever a, a little kind of stubby wing. <laughs> Report from the youngest prince who used to be a swan. <laughs> we returned once a year, hoping our sister would sense our wilderness inside her, a combination of ferocity and a stream of melted snow, that she'd shrink in upon herself, become a white bird, and climb a ladder made of wind to the roof of the clouds. The wings. Every moment that I wore them, I was a mountain in a range of mountains. Each brother one ship in a shining armada, a glorious company across indigo waters. We fled the witch, but once a year returned to proclaim that we were blessed, nobility with a treasure more beautiful than anything stowed in the vaults of our parents. To possess each jewel in midsummer's night sky, to claim every hidden fjord and mountain lake as your palace. Join us, we'd say, fly higher than the reach of any arrow, be the princess of storm and lawn, wind and deep water. But we could not bind her to the rope of our thought. She wanted us earthbound, she wanted us home, and when we last returned, she cast nets over us, a spell woven of nettles and silence. She compelled us back into stuttering apes. Courtiers ask, but I find I cannot speak of our flight, the glory of it, nor our satisfaction when we paused in the shallows among watercress and reeds. We all speak so little, our voices are scraped and clotted with loss. But when I'm alone with my brothers, they tease me, they cuff me, they call me Lucky, the one-armed prince of luck, as I alone am left with this banner, souvenir of the god I was. I call it my white flag, or my little sister, feathered scar, half a cape, curled wound that once was wing. So I was thinking a lot about this whole swan thing and why I was getting obsessed with the image of swans. And one thing I remembered was that uh, one of my favorite writers, Truman Capote, called the Manhattan socialites that he hung out with his swans. Uh, <laughs> Gloria Vanderbilt was one of them, Carol Mathow, all these women that uh, were beautiful and rich, and he always called them his swans. Swans. Truman Capote called them his swans, Manhattan girls by the way of bumfuck Virginia. Manhattan girls who wore diamond bracelets or antique men's watches, girls who knew the names of every doorman on the Upper East Side, those girls. Their laughter like ice in a cocktail shaker, in dining rooms, in speakeasy basements, fogged blue with cigarettes, long-necked girls with a hint of a drawl, he called them his swans, pale under moonlight or streetlight or the soft weight of mink. Look. Grizzled men place rings on their fingers. The only story these girls know ends with a wedding. The only wedding they imagine is a wedding to the king. But here comes a frog. He snuck into the courtyard near the palace. He's always lurking near a saloon or the palace. He rents a modest flat at the bottom of a fountain, and to each swan princess he sings the same tune. Tell me your secrets, every naughty secret, after I have whimpered and wept and recited my own. Tell me something about the king, or his mother, or the princess before you. And I will dive down in the fountain, the depths of the fountain, and bring up the golden ball, which is your youth. I will, I will find, said the frog, this polished bauble. It is quite like the sun, and I will place it in your empty hands. With a harsh cry, a tearing sound, you can step out of the husk of what you've become be a bird in the silence of the far northern reaches, a swan in the beauty and the silence of the far northern reaches. During dinner parties, at poolside, or coiled in a deck chair on the king's royal yacht, Capote flirted and cajoled in his wet, froggy voice. He'd tell you his secrets. They sparkled a heap of airline bottles of gin. He'd tell you someone else's secret, the, so the sorry tale of a lesser princess, the hilarious troubles of a cuckold duke. All the while, he'd mutter, do you have a secret? Have you ever been a swan? Do you want to be my princess? Every story needs a princess. I am the swan princess. I know, I know, but hear me out. I'm, I'm troubled by this itching. I'm sure it's wings packed like a parachute, but under my shoulders. 
I think I once owned a velvet pouch brimming with diamonds. I possess another life where I am lovely as I always long to be. A ballerina wearing only a flurry of December's new snow and somewhere there's a squat, an understanding frog who listens time and again to my story. He's funny, this toady, and I need to laugh. So I will believe him when he promises over coffee or bellinis or afternoon tea, when he promises to return to me everything I've lost. I will believe him, and we'll call that love. No. <laughs> I am Capote, Truman Capote. I soothe the feathers of this moment's true swan. Look at this notebook. I write down secrets. Nothing is a secret until it's shared. Tell me, oh tell me, if you tell me a secret, it's proof of your love. If I should repeat it to someone else, well, cut a fruit tart, put a slice on a plate, and bring free three forks. We'll call it delicious. <laughs> Let re me remind you of the beautiful day, the destined, the distant, most beautiful day, when glory and royalty checks are clutched in our hands. Beautiful. Oh, beautiful. I promise you. I promise you. We will host the most wonderful party. We will all be bridesmaids at the wedding of the moon. Thank you very much.